The Women in Music Speaker Series has developed into the hallmark of the sorority's national programs. An integral component of district and national conventions, this program engages our members by providing the opportunity to meet women who work in various aspects of the music profession, including professional performers, music therapists, and educators. This program attempts to connect women in our mission statement by giving women in music a face. For our April 2020 DC Alcoda Nationwide Workshop Weekend, we hosted Dr. Tanya Mitchell Spradlin as our honored and invited woman in music speaker. Dr. Tanya Mitchell Spradlin holds a master's in music education from the University of Georgia and a doctor of musical studies from the University of Kansas. She served as the Director of Bands at Chamberlain Charter High School in Chamberlain, Georgia, the Associate Director of Bands at Valdosta State University, most recently, the Assistant Director of Bands and Associate Director of Athletic Bands at the University of South Carolina. She has been appointed Director of Wind Band Studies at the Penn State School of Music, effective August 15, 2020. Join me in welcoming Dr. Tanya Mitchell Spradlin as our Women in Music speaker. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you virtually. Uh, thank you, Siobhan, for asking me to do this. Um, I'm really excited to speak to you all for the next little bit. Um, I'm even more excited because there is music beforehand. Like I can say I've never gone to an event to speak where there has been music that I really, really liked. So thank you for playing those tunes, Shaylin. Appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for being here. I know that there are many other things that you could be doing on a Saturday, but I appreciate you being here to spend a little time with me. Um, so I am going to share my screen with you all, and hopefully this works the way I want it to, and hopefully you can hear everything. There's a little clip at the end. Um, so I'm now sharing my screen. And what it should say on the screen is, where are you going? Okay, excellent. So when Siobhan asked me to speak, um, I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about. Um, and I eventually ended up settling on my life and some lessons I've learned along the way. And this came about by assessing some student work for a scholarship committee in particular. So I was reading dozens of letters explaining why young people wanted to go to conducting clinics. Um, I serve on the diversity committee for the College Band Directors National Association. And we have a grant that goes to women and people of color to get them to conducting clinics in places where they don't normally have that access. And one of the questions was, where do you see yourself in the future and world, where do you see the world of music right now today? And I was taken aback by just how many of these students, how many of these people had their lives planned out. As in, I think I'll teach for three to five years and then I'll get a master's degree and then I'll get a, doctor, a doctorate and then I'll become a college band director. And I heard uh, similar things in my music ed class. Um, they're all so focused and they want, they knew what they wanted to do with their lives and they had so much vision. So this is that music ed class, MUED 568. It's an organization and administration of school music programs at the University of South Carolina. I love these students. And I've been listening to them talk about their fairly prescribed planned futures and it got me thinking they are so ahead of me. I never had a timeline or a detailed plan for my life. When I was exiting my undergrad, if you asked, where do I see myself in five years? I think I would tell you the exact same thing that I think now, which is just, I want to be in a place where I can teach willing students and I can make music at a high level and I can use that to shape my community through music. So I never really had a plan. I never had an age where I wanted to be married and have kids. When I graduated from college, I had no desire to pursue additional degrees or to eventually teach college. And each path or opportunity kind of came as a result of the previous activity. So I'm calling that the resultant effect. Um, I never saw myself as someone trying to rise through the ranks, so to speak, or as a role model. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago, really, that I started trying to convince myself that my life or experiences may have some sort of meaning or be helpful to others. 
And so I'm a little bit more willing to share, but I still have some reservations about it. And I fight feelings of narcissism when I talk about myself. Uh, if you ask me a question, I'll gladly answer it. Uh, but asking me to broadly talk openly, I still feel a little bit of awkwardness, but I'll do my best. Uh, and so for the purpose of this talk, I want to focus on three particular things, three things that I think have really propelled me um, and that I am actually still working on now. But before I move on from the screen, I want to make sure to give credit to Libby Crowell. She's a member of the Epsilon Alpha chapter of Tau Beta Sigma here at the University of South Carolina, and she did this drawing here. This will be interactive in that you'll need something to write with and something to write on. I have my pencil and paper. And if you don't want to do it, then don't. I am literally sitting at my desk in my office at home and I won't know what you're doing one way or another. So in my mind, everyone's doing it because I'm behind a screen and I can't see you. Uh, so there are a few times in this talk where I'm going to write down a couple of things and I'm gonna ask that you write down a couple of things as well. So slightly interactive. So I mentioned that there were three things I wanted to focus on. And those three things uh, that have propelled me and worked for me have been values, drive, and inspiration. The so values define the kind of person you want to be. And this is by far the most important aspect of your, of your life, really, and your career because it shapes how you will achieve your goals in a way that's meaningful and that's valuable to you. And so for me, my values were to be student focused and student centered and to make students feel valuable and heard and seen. Um, I work really hard at getting to know everyone's names. Um, I'm mostly there in the Carolina band. There are over 300 people, but I would say I know maybe 180 of their names. It's not terrible. Um, Another one of my values was to provide opportunities for growth and then to not separate being a conductor and being a teacher to make them one and the same. And so my first writing activity, if you want to call it that, is what do you value? I want you to think of three things, three things that you value, really, really short, could just be one word. And these are three things that if you saw someone doing this or leading in this way, you would most likely be impressed or identify with them. And if you didn't see these things, you might have a difficult time identifying with them. So along with you, I'm gonna write my three. And so the three that I just wrote down were, and it will probably be backwards on your screen, but personal interactions, approach and organization. And it's with these values that often shape our mission. So the, these values have shaped my mission. So I'm, I'm sure many of you have talked about this already, but mission statement is your statement of purpose, description, function, and objectives. And it changes as you grow because you might meet those objectives and then come up with new ones. And so here are a couple of really excellent mission statements. Of course, I've included Tau Beta Sigma and Kappa Kappa Size. I've also included Life is Good, their mission statement is to spread the power of optimism, TED, to spread ideas, Tesla, to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy, Coca-Cola, to refresh the world, to inspire moments of optimism and happiness, uh, to make a difference. And so if we take these value systems, I mean, let's just take Coca-Cola, for instance, and in shaping their mission, you can tell that their value system lies in spreading optimism spreading happiness, refreshing people. There are a lot of other things that Coca-Cola does, and I just picked a few, but I thought they were good examples of taking a value system and making it into a mission. And so the next thing that we're going to do on this interactive writing, you all didn't expect to have to write stuff today, is to write what you think might be your mission statement stemming from those three things that you wrote down as your value system. And there's not a lot of writing in this, I promise you. There's only a couple more. Um, but I'll take about 10 seconds and I'll write mine too. So you're taking those three things that you wrote as your value, um, three values into a mission. So you can see I'm writing mine too. And for me, mine is to strengthen the world through music while recognizing and uplifting individuals 
and building inclusivity and creating opportunities for growth. And it's developed over time as my value system has changed. Um, and so now I want to talk a little bit about mission and vision or mission and values together. So a couple of things worked to shape my mission and to shape my values. Uh, and as you can see from these images I put here, uh, this is a good example of what began to shape my value system as in relation to being a conductor, an educator, and a teacher. It was always ingrained in me that conductors look like the top two images on the screen and that teachers look like the bottom two images on the screen. Even in preparing this presentation, when I searched teacher, I got a lot of women and a great deal of diversity. And when I searched conductor or band director, I got mostly white males. And these are just stock images from Google searches or Pexel searches. And so think about that. We use the internet to explore the world that we can't see and to expand our horizons and to broaden our perspectives. Yet a basic search only shows you a very narrow and a very limited idea. And so seeing this, not just from Google searches, but in life really shaped my mission statement, my value system. And so the top two are older, white, male, serious conductors. The bottom two are younger, more diverse, female, hands-on, smiley. Yet I wanted to be a conductor and a teacher. And I had very few models for what that looked like. I wanted to be taken seriously, but I didn't look like or act like anyone in the roles that I wanted. And there's so much stigma and stereotype that young ladies are often pushed into elementary or middle school positions because they smile a lot or that they're kind. And we use words like, she has a better temperament or disposition for that age. But that's only because we're in a field of stereotypes. And often if you don't see it done, it's hard to have an image of what it looks like to do it effectively. Um, so that led to my eventual, eventual mission. If you can see it, then you can be it. And once I realized that, I worked harder to be seen so that others can see more possibilities. So again, this image on the screen is another uh, piece of artwork done by Libby Crowell, University of South Carolina. And I thought a lot about who are you doing it for? So everyone's doing it for something, you know, even if they don't know it. Every time you do something well, someone's watching, right? Uh, someone is being lifted up. If you're the first one from your hometown to go to college, then you just showed everyone else that it's possible. If you're able to juggle school, friends, a job, fraternity, sorority, and you do it with grace, then you show your colleagues, your friends that it's possible. So the sooner you accept that each and every one of you on this call today uh, is a role model, the sooner you will be able to embrace and then harness that power. And so the image, by the way, I mentioned is Libby Crowell, who's done an amazing job, I think, of being herself and harnessing her power. So I show a lot of her artwork in this uh, presentation. So we're all doing this for music, but who is music for? You know, I always do, I've, in my past, I had always done everything I did for my students and for me. And now I take a much broader stance. I think about doing it for all women, for all Afri African American people, for those with natural hair, which is a completely different struggle unto itself, uh, for all marginalized people. And then, of course, to all, uh, of course, for music itself. And so that doesn't mean that I'm not doing it for others or actively working to exclude anyone. I just have a unique ability to provide representation. We all do, and we should embrace that. And once you give fully into who you're doing it for, why you're doing it, your path may become more meaningful and more focused. So once again, you know what you're doing, why, who you're doing it for and your purpose, your vision will be a little less blurry. So vision is the result of clear values and clear purpose. And once you have those guides, vision sometimes unfolds. So I mentioned that there are three things that we're gonna talk about. The first was values, the second was drive, the third was inspiration. So let's talk about drive a little bit. Uh, routine in particular. Routine is everything. 
you can accomplish any measurable goal with a routine. It's important for your mental health. It helps relieve anxiety. Uh, it helps you to feel useful. It helps you to feel like you're moving forward in life. Uh, in the book, a book that I'm reading now, the author, Johan Hari, states that human beings become more depressed when we lose these nine things. And so I'm going to talk, I'll cite four of those nine things. And those four are when we lose meaningful, when we lose when you lose the connection to our natural world, and when we lose the ability to see a hopeful and secure future. Well, that's literally our lives right now with coronavirus as we're all stuck inside. Uh, but what do we do to get past it? Routine is how we get past it. Um, I read an article about how a prisoner survived his time in prison. And he mentioned that every day he had a routine. Every morning he woke up and he did his exercise. Every day before lunch, he would read. Every day after lunch, he would study. He would have the same routine every day, and that kept him sane, versus his counterparts that lived in this free-for-all and had a very difficult time. Now, I'm not trying to liken our situation to prison whatsoever. It's quite different. We have choices. We have homes. We have streaming devices. Uh, but for some people, you may not have those things, and it might feel more like you're living in a prison than others. Routine will help. Uh, so I can't stress enough how important routine is. You might be able to see behind me my little whiteboard that I write on every day what I'm going to do and when I'm going to do it. Um, I will uh, be honest with all of you that it still says Tuesday, April 21st, because I didn't do a good job of writing it Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, but little things like that certainly help with keeping everyday focus. Uh, so the next thing is a say yes attitude. And what that really means is agreeing to put yourself in situations that make you uncomfortable because those are situations that cause you to grow. Uh, my first ever conducting teacher told me when I got my first job to say yes to everything, say yes to every honor band, say yes to visiting every school, say yes to taking time where I didn't have classes to go sit in on someone else's classroom. And that's how you get your name out there and that's how you grow. That feeling when your heart starts to pound and your blood starts to rush and you start to breathe a little bit shorter. That slight feeling of pressure, that's that feeling that you need to grow, that feeling that you need to get comfortable every now and then in your life to know that you're making strides forward. And then finally, saying no to boredom. Uh, in the household that I grew up in, it was not okay to say that you're bored. Um, if you said that, my mom would tell me or my two brothers to do some ridiculous task that always took five times longer than it should have, like go clean the grout between the tiles in the bathroom, or go pull the weeds from the backyard, or go scrub all of the vents. And so we said we were bored. We found ways to be creative, books to read, different games to play, so we were never bored. And I think having that, um, having that character trait has helped me even now to feel uh, slightly, to feel a little bit more drive to keep working, <laughs> especially during a time right now where it's difficult to stay motivated. And so as a charge to you all, having that drive, a routine, a say yes attitude and finding ways not to be as bored um, will help you in the future. I really like this cartoon because it explains how small changes every day, small changes in that routine and that schedule can lead to a really large impact. So the first two values, the second drive and the last inspiration. Everyone says believe in yourself. Be your own inspiration. Be your own source of strength. And that is important and that is necessary. But honestly, everyone needs someone to simply believe in them as well. Some people more than others, but it sure feels validating to have support. So the people who inspire me are my original conducting teacher, uh, Paul Popeil. He's the reason I'm teaching high school and not college. He's the director of bands at the University of Kansas and my first conducting teacher during my undergrad at Indiana University. His ensemble sounds fantastic, all without being stuffy. And he laughs and he jokes and he makes people feel heard and seen and valued. 
and gives time to what he holds dear. Um, Myra Roden is a director of bands, the director of bands at Fayetteville High School in Fayetteville, Georgia. She has a stellar program and she showed me what it looked like to be a woman, specifically a black woman, represent, uh, respected by her colleagues in her field. She's totally herself, she's bright, she's effervescent, she's organized and focused, firm yet kind, and doesn't seem to be trying <coughs> excuse me, to fit into a world. She's just doing her, and I don't even know if she's aware of just how many lives she has changed. And so several other inspirations who I have are people who I know very well but don't know me, like Michelle Obama and Shonda Rhimes, who I'll talk a little bit more about um, at the end of this uh, little talk today. And so I find inspiration from people who share my value system, and that is an extremely helpful thing to do. So I find myself moved, especially when I see others who work in the same field I have doing something really well that aligns with my value system. And so the last thing that we're going to write today, if you will indulge me in the little writing that we're doing on our notepads is who inspires you and why? How do they make a difference in your life? Lately, I have felt empowered um, by friends of mine who've been openly talking about the change they wanted to see in our field uh, to the point now that if you perform at Midwest, um, starting in 2021, or if you perform at the National Collegiate, uh, the National College Band Directors Association um, National Conference, then you are required to play at least one piece by a woman. And that came from a charge by, by people who believe that there should be more diverse programming, that we have to stop playing the same music by one class of people and instead show representation across the board. And there was a big charge that, uh, that kind of pushed this new idea into fruition. And it was really powerful and impactful to see the effects of that. And it made me more comfortable talking about you know, my charge and things I hold dear. Um, and it's super inspirational. So all of the people who led to that change, I mean, think about 30, 40 years ago, how many grassroots movements led to real change in our country. And we don't see as much of that. So to see a group of people band together and say, no, we need this type of change. And then to see that change enacted is a really special thing, an exciting thing. Um, and I have found excitement by seeing People who look like me do what I do. There are not that many, uh, eight or nine to be exact, in the college world. That means eight or nine African-American female college band directors in the entire country, y'all, and about 15 to 20 in the history of the United States, the entire history of America. And then we finally have a few head directors of bands at uh, HBCUs, but none um, no one that I found that looks like me is a director of bands at a power five institution or D one institution until next year when I start at Penn state. And I don't say that to brag. I say that to highlight the entire history of bands and colleges across the country that it took until 2020 for this to happen. And so I think I used to be afraid to talk about this openly. And I now think that it is a charge that it's something that needs to be said because we've seen the effects that has had on programming at these major conferences and with these major ensembles. I'm excited, I'm excited to see diverse change in the future of conductors as well. And so that leads me to the last little part of this, which is advocacy. Sometimes advertising gives you the motivation you need to get things done because you know other people are watching. And there is a fine line between bragging and then show, showcasing some exciting things that you're doing that are really, really amazing. Um, and I also mentioned it gives you motivation because others know that you're doing it and others are now watching. And that's precisely why I don't, when I start a new fitness routine, I don't tell anyone and I don't post anything because then there's no one to hold me accountable when I inevitably stop after a few days. So I mentioned I talk about Shonda Rhimes a little bit more. And um, I want to explain why. Uh, she's a role model for me because she wrote three primetime shows on a major network uh, television channel, all at the exact same time. So just imagine the work it takes to do one. 
but she had three at the exact same time. Mr. Gray's Anatomy had to go to murder and um, scandal. And so even if you don't watch those shows or you don't like those shows, you can't take away that making that sort of progress at the same time uh, is pretty incredible, all while raising children uh, and finding herself and being herself. She holds a lot of firsts. And so I want to play a short clip by her from her Dartmouth commencement speech in 2014. Uh, It starts with, they tell you to follow your dreams. And it resonated with me because it's the process of reaching your goals, the process, not the lofty ideas that they may someday simply occur. Um, When people give these kinds of speeches, they usually tell you all kinds of wise and heartfelt things. They have wisdom to impart. They have lessons to share. They tell you, follow your dreams. Listen to your spirit, change the world, make your mark, find your inner voice and make it sing. Embrace failure, dream, dream and dream big. As a matter of fact, dream and don't start, stop dreaming until all of your dreams come true. I think that's crap. I think a lot of people dream and while they are busy dreaming, the really happy people, the really successful people, The really interesting, engaged, powerful people are busy doing. The dreamers, they stare at the sky and they make plans and they hope and they talk about it endlessly. And they start a lot of sentences with, I want to be or I wish. I want to be a writer. I wish I could travel around the world. And they dream of it. The buttoned up ones meet for cocktails and they brag about their dreams. And the hippie ones have vision boards and they meditate about their dreams. And maybe you write in journals about your dreams or discuss it endlessly with your best friend or your girlfriend or your mother and it feels really good. You're talking about it and you're planning it kind of. You are blue skying your life. And that is what everyone says you should be doing, right? I mean, that's what Oprah and Bill Gates did to get successful, right? No. Dreams are lovely, but they are just dreams, fleeting, ephemeral, pretty. But dreams do not come true just because you dream them. It's hard work that makes things happen. It's hard work that creates change. So lesson one, I guess, is ditch the dream and be a doer, not a dreamer. I hope that you're able to hear the entirety of what she said for about a minute and 35 seconds. Lesson one, be a doer, not a dreamer. And so when you're on the road to doing, when you're racing or you're running or you're hiking, Experts always say, don't look down, look forward. Um, If you look to the goal, not to each step, then you won't get caught up with how you're getting there. You won't get bogged down in the immense enormity of how much work it truly takes to get to the peak. So in racing, that's how you're able to drive at ridiculously fast speeds, yet still maneuver difficult turns. It's how you can keep focused when you're climbing a 14,000 foot mountain. It's how you stay focused when you're running a marathon. You look forward and not down. But when you look down, because you inevitably will, we all inevitably will, look down to your values and look down to your mission. And that will give you some sort of guide to propel you forward. And then it's also important to remember, stopping on a bench on the way to the top of the peak for a few minutes doesn't mean that you're not reaching your goal. If you need to stop working for a while and binge on Netflix for a couple of days until you get bored, that's fine. Uh, It's a step along the goal. It does not mean that you're not reaching the goal at all. So we talked about values. We talked about mission. We talked about drive. And we talked a little bit about Shonda Rhimes too. And so this is another quote from her. And it comes from a moment from, that she talks about in her book, The Year of Yes. Um, clearly that was a very impactful read for me. And that's why I've mentioned it a couple of times in this talk. So Shonda Rhimes was at an award ceremony for women in media. And she noticed that after each woman won an award, she didn't stand up and receive the award. Instead, she hung her head or said something self-deprecating like, oh, I just got lucky, or, oh, yes, it was a team effort. I didn't really do anything, or I don't deserve this. And she goes on to say, well, you didn't just trip and fall, and then magically you got up and a whole book was written, or you didn't go to bed one night, and then you woke up and underneath your pillow was a script to a television show. 
it's late nights and it's hard work, recognize and receive it. And so I really like this quote of hers for that reason. Don't wait to get lucky, work hard, and then you'll notice that doors begin to magically open for you. It's like what Thomas Jefferson said. I find the harder I work, the luckier I get. And as you work, think back to your values. Think back to that mission. Think back to what drives you, who inspires you or what inspires you. And then go do it and go and show it. And so all in all, be a doer, not a dreamer. And now go to work.